stand as we sing together and prepare our hearts to hear God's word preached this evening. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my sinking hopes are few i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be the shore and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then goes the anchor though I just of unbelief hopeless somehow oh my soul now lift your eyes to Calvary this my ballast of assurance see his love forever proved I will hold fast to the anchor it shall never
You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord. Father, uh, we come before you thanking you for an audience with you through Christ. And, and Lord, now as we come to your word, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, that our minds would um, be placed upon what we are studying in the book of 1 Timothy. And and Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, a short passage, but a lot of application in this passage. By the way, we will, I think I said it earlier, we will hear the result at the end of the service. So I know we're all wondering about that, but we'll devote ourselves to uh, the word of God now. I want you to remember that First Timothy is a letter of Paul to Timothy, who is one of the pastor teachers of the church, and he's left on assignment at the church at Ephesus. That was verse 3 of chapter 1. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Listen, nobody likes conflict, uh, but because of a sin-tarnished world because of the devil who seeks to diminish God's glory, because of the sin nature of man, we will face conflict. Christians intent on trusting and obeying God, intent on building the church with Jesus, will face conflict. From without, We'll face it when we define God's will, when we call sin, sin, when we say that there is salvation only in Jesus. In other words, when we speak the truth, voices will rise against that in our culture. We'll face it from within the church when members won't reconcile, when personal preference is mistaken for the Lord's will, and as here in Ephesus, when strange doctrines are being taught. And we face conflict in our own hearts. Let's be honest, that's where one of our enemies is, the sin nature. We face conflict when we know we need to stay faithful in conduct and commitment, and yet there's either temptation or comfort that is calling us in another direction. Until Jesus returns, following Christ fully is a battle, and it requires dedication. That's the word I chose for the church health essential this evening, dedication. And I would say a healthy church encourages and strengthens the dedication of believers. Now, by God's design, 1 Timothy, a letter from Paul to Timothy, is in the canon 
of Scripture. And so I take from that that Paul's counsel to Timothy is the counsel we need in the church today. And so we are studying this book. Number one, concerning dedication, it means being dedicated to your assignment. 1 Timothy 1.18, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, son spiritually, Paul is thinking he had nurtured Timothy's faith, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. The idea of fighting here is, is most likely serving as a soldier in a military campaign, a just, a good military campaign. Fight the good fight. Serve as a soldier faithfully. Because there is, there was and there is a battle to proclaim the truth of Christ and live the truth, as we saw this morning in the Philippian passage, building the Lord's church in the face of the devil, in the face of the enemies of Christ, in the face of the world, and in the face of our own flesh at times. And this is the good fight. It is a fight worth fighting. It is a fight that honors Jesus, and we need to be dedicated to it. Paul uses the fight metaphor often. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, if you want to turn the pages uh, to chapter 6, verse 11, he presents it as a fight to personally follow Christ fully. He says to Timothy, flee from these things, and these things are sinful things in context. Flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So it is a fight to personally follow Christ fully. It is a fight to not get distracted. Second Timothy, another letter to Timothy, but meant for us all because God put it in the canon. Second Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier. There, the fight metaphor again. Being a soldier, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. There is a fight to not get distracted and being taken off course. And I would say it is a fight to follow truth alone. 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. A fight to follow the truth alone. Now listen, I'm not going to fight with anybody tonight about who has the better team this year, the Baltimore Ravens or the Washington Commanders. I know the answer to that already. <laughs> it's Baltimore, even though they had another tough loss. Um, but I wouldn't fight about that. But I will fight to exalt the deity and superiority of Jesus to a world that sees him merely as a prophet or a good man. We will fight for that. I'm not going to fight with anyone about preaching or teaching style, although I'm committed to expository teaching, but I will fight always for preaching and teaching that comes from and stays true to the Bible. And I'm not going to fight with anyone for very long about temporal matters, I have to say for very long because sometimes I do. I'm known as a gentle bulldog on the phone when I think I've been unjustly treated by a business or some, some payment I've made. Anyway, I try to be very kind. But I'm not going to fight for too long about temporal matters of money or property because the good fight concerns the eternal destiny of souls, not anything down here. Particularly for Timothy, there was the present battle to refute the false teaching described earlier in the chapter that we saw a couple weeks ago. It was hurting the building of the Lord's church. And so we come again to verse 18. This command 
A charge from an authority is what this means. Like a military command from an officer, this command, Paul as the officer, the apostle, charging Timothy, this command, I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, I place it before you as your responsibility. You're the man, Timothy, to accomplish this part of the mission of building the church. But you're not being asked to do something you've not been chosen for and equipped for by the Lord of our battle. We keep reading verse 18. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you. In 1 Timothy 4, 14, we'll get to this passage, but it says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. A group of elders, along with Paul, had laid hands on Timothy, probably setting him apart for ministry, what we would call an ordination today. And at that time, he received, according to Paul here, a a spiritual gift as prophecies were spoken. Probably uh, statements concerning the service God was setting him apart for. And statements concerning his equipping from God. Uh, Maybe similar to the words Ananias received and spoke to Paul. The Lord said to Ananias, go For he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. That would have been a prophecy concerning Paul. So in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, remember those, Timothy, that by them, by the prophecies, in other words, with the enabling of God and the assurance that he has chosen you for this role, you fight the good fight. Stand firm, Timothy, for the truth of the gospel that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, verse 15, and against anything that threatens the clarity of Christ and him crucified. As believers, we are also to fight the good fight, and we have enabling, and we have assurance. There are, quote-unquote, prophecies, uh, statements of scripture that concern Christians in general that assure us that God has chosen us and placed us in places of service as he has willed. Let me read them to you. Ephesians 4, 7, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. First, Peter 4.10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. John 15.5, I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So in light of the enabling by the spirit, by the scripture, by Christ, the vine, and the assurances of God that he has gifted each one of us for service. We're a part of the fight. We're a part of the battle, building the church. The encouragement is to be dedicated. Be dedicated to your assignment, your assignment in his church, uh, your assignment as a Christian spouse, your assignment as a Christian parent, a Christian teacher, a Christian friend, a Christian citizen, etc., You have a part to play. You have ground to stand upon and represent Christ. So dedication means dedication to the assignment. And behind that is dedication to Christ, the second point in the outline. 
Because if you're to be dedicated to your assignment, you will have to remember that behind your assignment is the Lord, who is worthy of your steadfast belief and good behavior. Verse 19, keeping faith and a good conscience. Now, these two things are mentioned in in verse 5, faith and a good conscience. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Faith in this context is, is continuing to believe God's revealed truth and continuing to trust God and God's truth when the battle gets tough. Faith. And a good conscience? It's talking about the moral compass that points to what is right. And a good conscience is going to point accurately to what is right. The conscience is something God gave to each created person. It is a built-in ability of the mind to pass moral judgment on ourselves and others, but approving or disapproving our actions, our thoughts, our plans, telling us if what we have done or what we are planning to do is wrong or right, and whether we deserve punishment or not. The conscience, two elements of it primarily, an awareness of things certain things as being right or wrong, so an awareness of right and wrong, and an ability to apply laws and rules, of course for the Christian, from the Lord to specific situations. Paul says in Romans 2, 14 and 15, that God has written knowledge of his law on every human heart, which is why I say every created being has been given a sense of right and wrong by God. But one's conscience can be misinformed, can be a condition to regard evil as good, which is where Romans 1 shows us what happens there. Uh, it can become dull through repeated sin without repenting of that sin. So the conscience must be educated to judge scripturally. The teaching of scripture is essential to this. And keeping faith in God's word is essential to this. And so if you believe that God's word is the truth, then the teaching of scripture will mean much to you. Those two must go together. You just don't say, okay, I'm going to keep reading the Bible through every year. No, you, you come with a heart that has faith in God's word. The New Testament ideal is a conscience free from guilt and able to guide us in a holy direction. That would be a good So notice that faith and a good conscience are linked. If you say you believe in Jesus and your faith is sincere, you will want to live to please him. Faith produces works, obedience, or it is not true faith, according to Scripture. A good conscience will keep checking to make sure that your actions are consistent with your beliefs. For example, for those of us who teach, do we practice what we teach? There's always, well, there should always be honest assessment there as a teacher prepares, as he gives a lesson, as he thinks over truths that he's taught. But notice here, it's not always that way because some have rejected, have tossed aside good conscience, faith, and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Literally, the faith. They've failed to stay on course by dismissing what their consciences were telling them. They altered their, listen, dismissed what the conscience was saying to them, but you can't live that way. You you then alter your beliefs, and that leads you to further compromise, further off the course. They go into dangerous waters of untruth, and Paul says they wreck the ship. Their life of following God's revealed truth is in shambles. And he names names. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander. According to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, Hymenaeus went astray, from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place, the resurrection of believers. These were 
self-righteous men who wanted to be teachers, who wanted to have a following. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17, that their empty talk spread like gangrene. And Paul dealt with them decisively. Look at what he does, verse 20. Whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to, to blaspheme. The word taught there is a word translated discipline in Hebrews 12. And there's an example of, of this same thing uh, in Paul's dealings with the Corinthian church. That might have just come to your mind if you're familiar with it. There was a man committing extreme immorality in the church at Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Paul writes, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here, there, and here, Paul, with apostolic authority, removed that man in Corinth from fellowship uh, with the church and cast the unrepentant sinner to the adversary, Satan, who seeks to devour so that his physical life would be adversely affected in some way. That's drastic to us. It should seem drastic, but it's a fight. It's a battle. Drastic measure needed to be taken for purity in the church. So he seems he's doing a similar thing here to Hymenaeus and Alexander so that they will be taught the lesson that they cannot blaspheme Christ by opposing the truth about him and teaching falsehood. I want you to notice, Paul says, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. I see that as the aim is reclamation, not damnation of these two, but reclamation. He wants them to be taught not to blaspheme. So Paul pointed out these two by name to warn Timothy of their opposition. Likely these are two that are in view at the beginning of the chapter when he's told he's at Ephesus to deal with false teaching. He's also warning Timothy and us of the danger of personally not keeping faith in a good conscience. These two, Hymenaeus and Alexander, did not stick with the revealed truth of God. These two violated their consciences. These two became enemies of the work of building the church. They were not faithful to, they were not dedicated to Christ. Don't go in that direction, is what Paul is saying, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Timothy, take it to heart. Battle well. Be a good soldier for Christ. So some implications for Timothy and for us. Uh, Paul is certainly saying to Timothy, God is saying to us, be, be dedicated to our assignment in the church and in the world, wherever your circle is in the world. Be faithful to your assignment. You are on assignment in your church, in your home, in your community, your place of work if you have one, in school as a student, in the grocery store, et cetera, et cetera, you are on assignment to represent and follow the truth of Jesus Christ. What did we hear this morning? To live a life worthy of the gospel. Be dedicated to our assignment. And secondly, be dedicated to Christ. Think like he thinks. That's not a mystical thing. That's a scriptural thing. Know the scripture so that you will think like he thinks. And then you will act, or you can, act like he wants you to act. Don't dismiss what your conscience, trained by scripture, the good conscience, is indicating as right and wrong. Now listen, this is a battle. And I want to say, uh, tangentially but importantly, there are good causes to be involved in in life that, that takes some time and attention. Could be getting involved in a political election for a candidate that you believe in, getting involved in school curriculum, as that's extremely important. 
in the public school particularly, but in all schools, getting involved in the truth about abortion, getting involved in areas of justice in our culture and so forth. These are good causes to be involved in. We are to be salt and light to our world, and we should seek to influence it, certainly. That's a part of the battle, to be influencers. But listen carefully, and, and I'm not, I, I want to be clear in this. I think those are good causes. I would encourage you to be involved where you have the heart to be, but never think that that cause is the main thing. No, the gospel is the main thing uh, because... We are to be salt and light, but good causes can become distractions if our focus becomes the gaining of, I, I call it territory. In other words, uh, we're going to take back the schools. That kind of language lets me know that someone thinks that the quest of Christianity is to make the school system Christian. And that's not be influencers for sure, but that's not our task. Let me explain. The fight is not to fix the world. Jesus will do that when he returns. The fight is to witness to the world. Yes, do that as an influencer, but always do that with the thought that you are among souls who need the gospel. So if we were able to flip a, a school curriculum into what would be good. That would be great for the students. But that's, that's not dealing with their soul. That, that will give them a better education. You see what I mean? Our fight is not to fix the world, although be influencers in that. But the fight is to witness to the world. That's the battle that Paul is talking about. That's the battle that he wants Timothy to not get distracted from. When you leave this world, how do you want to be remembered? Certainly not like Hymenaeus or Alexander who tossed aside their moral compass and ended up fighting against the Lord. When you stand before Jesus, what kind of life will you have offered him? He's worthy of your dedication. And Paul is the great example here. He's able to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy, Chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. That's, that's a good soldier who's able to say that at the end of his life. That's what we strive for. Let's pray together. Oh, well, Father, we, we do thank you. We thank you for these words to Timothy that we can take to heart, to be dedicated to our assignment to be serving you well in whatever manner that is in the church, but using our gifts to serve you well, knowing that in doing so, we are, we are showing our dedication to Christ. Help us to be dedicated. Help us to be good soldiers, dedicated to the cause of the gospel, willingly obeying, courageously obeying, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.